Golden Radio Hour. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. I think it was the nastiest weather I'd ever seen. It wasn't that there'd been a big storm or anything. It was just plain nasty. The sun hadn't shone for three and a half weeks. Nothing but huge banks of black clouds that filled the sky and never moved. And when it finally broke, it was a downpour of the coldest and dreariest rain you ever saw. For two days, Chester and I never went out of the office. We didn't need to. There was nothing going on in town. There wasn't a soul on the streets. Everybody just holed up. Chester and I kept the fire going on the stove and tried to keep as warm as we could. And then on the morning of the third day... Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon? What? Wake up, Mr. Dillon. What? Uh, what is it, Chester? What's the matter? Huh? Come over here and look out the window. <sighs> Goodness sake, alive. Well, what's the matter? What's happened? It just looked. It stopped raining. Oh. The clouds are beginning to blow away. Why, well, I bet you we'll be seeing the sun before the day is over. Uh, well, I hope you're right. We could use a little sunshine. Oh, we sure could. You know, Mr. Dillon, I've been so blue for the last couple of days. I, I Oh, I, I boiled some coffee for you. It's on the stove. Oh, thank you, Chester. Yeah, like, like I was saying, I've been just awful low, Mr. Dillon. It's funny how the weather affects you, isn't it? Yeah, it does almost everybody, Chester. Ah, this coffee's good. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, Chester, how'd you like to go for a little ride, huh? Make us feel good to get out in the open after being cooped up for the last couple of days. Why don't we ride down to old man Johnson's? I've been meaning to talk to him anyway. Well, I'll tell you, that's a wonderful idea, Mr. Dillon. I'd be proud to go. Besides, Thurlow needs a good workout. I don't know of anything that's worse for a horse than just stand around in a <laughs> All right, all right, Chester. In... I'm going to take time to shave, and then we'll get some breakfast and ride out. Huh? Well, yes, sir, Mr. Dillon, yes, sir. You were right, Mr. Dillon. Nothing like a ride in real brisk weather to make you feel fitter than a fiddle. Well, I'd say it's a little more than brisk, Chester. It's downright cold. This wind doesn't help much. Well, we haven't got much farther to go. How far would you say we've come? Oh, about 15 miles. Well, then we should be there pretty soon. There. Look at there, Mr. Dillon. What to tell you? What? There's a patch of sunlight just come through. Over there to the right. See? My, isn't that pretty. Chester. Hmm? There by that hackberry tree there in the sunlight. You see? What is that? Can you make it out? Where? Oh, yeah, I do see something, but I can't... Come on, let's see. ride over to it. Huh? Well, Mr. Dillon, it looks like somebody all huddled up leaning against the tree. Why, it's an Indian. Yeah, a woman. Hey, pull up here. Uh, oh, oh. I don't think she's heard us. Hello there. Well, she didn't even look up, Mr. Dillon. Hello. Is something wrong? Well, there sure must be. <laughs> hey, let's walk up, Chester. Can we help you, miss? She won't even lift her head. Uh, 
Miss, what's wrong? She looks sort of befogged, don't she? Yeah. Miss, here, look at me. No, I'm not going to hurt you. Chester, she's burning up with fever. Well, what in the world is she doing way out here in the middle of nowhere anyway? Being out here in all this weather, she's probably caught her death in the morning. Yeah, you may be right, Chester. We're going to have to get her back to Dodge fast. She needs the dock real bad. Get the horses. We're going to have to hurry. Pretty little girl she was. I declare I don't think I've ever seen a more beautiful woman. Yeah. And her hair. You know, I think Indian women have the prettiest hair in the whole world. Seems such a shame that such a pretty little thing she has to be all... Matt? Oh, hi, you kidding. One of the boys at the Texas Trail told me he saw you and Chester riding up the street here, Doc's office, and... That you were carrying an Indian girl in your arms. He said she looked like she was dead. What happened? Oh, we found her out in the middle of the plains. That's right, Miss Kitty. She was just sitting under a big old hackberry tree. Well, what was wrong with her? I don't know. Exposure, I guess. Doc don't think there's much chance for her, Miss Kitty. Ah, oh, that's too bad. Uh, Matt, you better come in. Yeah. Miss Kitty. Doc? How is she, Doc? I should just regain consciousness. But I'm afraid I can't see how she's still alive. Well, you think I could talk to her? Well, you can try. I certainly won't hurt anything. But I'd like to find out who she is so that I could notify her people. If... Yeah, well, you better hurry. Yeah. Miss? Miss, can you hear me? Miss, listen to me. Go, go away. Please, tell me who you are. Leave me alone. Won't you talk to me? Now, what's your name? I... I want to die. What happened? Why were you out on the plains all by yourself with... Were you lost? I would die. I would die alone. Matt, I... Yeah, I know. Miss, please, won't you tell me who your people are? Outside with Chester and Kitty. All right. Uh, when you come out, would you bring me her ring and that necklace she's wearing? Uh, all right, Matt, if you want. But, but what do... Just bring them to me, will you? Well, Matt? Yeah. Uh, Chester, we got a job on our hands. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon? There's something wrong about this, and I'm going to find out what. What do you mean? She was wearing a gold wedding ring. Yes, but Mr. Dillon, Indians don't use wedding rings. I know. Then you mean you think she was married to a white man, Matt? Yeah. Here's a necklace, Matt. Thanks, Doc. Have any of you heard of anybody around town marrying an Indian girl in the last year or so? No, no, Matt. No. Well, there ain't but one squaw man in the whole town that I know of, Jack Benson. And he married his squaw some eight or ten years ago. Well, then we're going to have to start from the other end. We've got to identify her. We'll have to find out what tribe she's from. And she looks like an Arapaho, Matt, from her clothing. Well, I thought that too, Doc, but which camp? There are three Arapaho camps within 40 miles of here. Say, Mr. Dillon, maybe Great Eagle could help you. Yeah. Well, he's camped down by Sandy Fork now, isn't he? He knows you. He's about the friendliest Indian around here these days. 
Say, Matt, don't you think this might cause trouble if you let them know that a white man is mixed up in this? What? Uh, wouldn't it be better to just bury her? In... Do you think that's the right thing, Doc? Oh, no, 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 I guess not. But I was talking to Colonel Jackson out at the fort the other day, and he said he was expecting us to have some real Indian trouble any day now. And this might start something. I know there's that possibility, Doc, but I also know that there was something behind this girl's death, and I think it's my duty to find out what. I'm sure I can talk to Great Eagle and get what information I need without stirring up anything. I hope you're right, Matt. Yeah, I hope I am, too. Chester? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon? Get our things ready. We'll start for Great Eagle's camp tonight. I figured it'd take us about five hours, and I was pretty close to right. The sun had been up maybe 30 or 40 minutes when we came to the crest of a range of hills. And there spread out below us alongside the Sandy Fork was Great Eagle's camp. We were spotted a good while before we got there, and when we pulled up, all the squaws had disappeared, and we were greeted by what looked like the entire male population. They just stood and watched us sullenly as we dismounted. I don't think they're too happy to see us, Mr. Dillon. Well, you may be right, Chester. I, uh, I've come to see your leader, Great Eagle. Tell him his friend Matt Dillon has ridden from Dodge City to see him. Maybe they don't understand. No, they understand, all right. Please tell Great Eagle it's of importance that I see him. You are not wanted here. Great Eagle will not see you. Why don't you let Great Eagle decide that? Now tell him. I wish to see him. I know God. It's a bullet. It's a heat down. Great Eagle is ill. But I will tell him you are here. I thought for a minute there that we'd rode all this way for nothing, Mr. Dillon. Well, we may have, Chester. I wouldn't say these fellows is very sociable, would you? No. Doc must have been right about trouble brewing. Well, the last time we was out here, Great Eagle was real friendly. I swear, I don't know what we've done Chester, to make them feel so good. you're talking too much. Yes, sir. Come. Here, inside. Matt Dillon, it is good to see you once more. And you, Great Eagle. You wish to talk with me? Yes, I do. I, I'm in need of your help. To be able to return your many kindnesses pleases me. I, uh, I would first like to explain to you that I am aware of the unrest between your people and mine. And it's my desire that what I tell you be as a confidence between friends. If it were known, it might cause further trouble. It will be as a confidence. Thank you. Well, yesterday we found a young girl on the plains. She suffered from exposure. So we took her back to Dodge City for medical attention as fast as we could. But we were too late. She was of your people. Her clothing told me that, so I came to you to help me identify her. I can't tell you why, but I feel that there was evil behind the death of this girl. And I must find out about it. You see, she was wearing a gold wedding ring. The ring of a white man. Can you describe the girl? Well, I can only tell you that she was of great beauty. and Well, here, she wore this. necklace. It's unusual in design. I thought it might help in identifying her. 
Yes, it helps. Then she was from this camp, you knew her? Yes, I knew her. She was my daughter. We will return to the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this Monday night, hear Virginia Mayo as a beauty who became one of the great skippers on The China Run. Remember, it's a full hour of dramatic adventure this Monday night on the Lux Summer Theater over most of these same CBS radio stations. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. I looked at Great Eagle's face, and all of a sudden, Doc's warning came back to me. I saw Chester out of the corner of my eye. He looked exactly the way I felt, that hopeless feeling of not knowing what to do. I guess we must have stood for maybe a minute. Nothing was said. This man sitting before us, this man of great dignity, with his bronze face showing no emotion, just staring into nothing holding the necklace in his huge hands. Great Eagle, we had no idea... Thank you. I understand. I, uh... I'm sorry to have to ask this now, Great Eagle, but do you know what might have happened? I know... nothing. Where is my daughter? She is at Dr. Adams' office in Dodge City. She will be buried here. I will come for her. You mean, come into Dodge? I will be there before sundown of this day. Well, Great Eagle, with this unrest between our peoples, I don't think it would be but wise to come right into town. There, there are people there that might cause trouble. Before sundown, I will come for her. But isn't it running a chance unnecessarily? We... We could arrange to meet you on the other side of the river, or maybe... Before sundown of this day, with my braves, I will come into Dodge City for my daughter. But you can't bring your braves right into... All right, Great Eagle, I'll do what I can to see that there's no trouble. Before sundown, then. <laughs> rode hard to get back to Dodge. There was a lot to be done. Chester didn't say anything, but I knew he was worried, and he wasn't alone. If this thing wasn't handled properly, it might turn into the worst trouble that any of us had ever seen. We got back into Dodge just before noon, and I sent Chester off to spread the word about what was going to happen. I figured it was better for everybody to know about it as soon as possible, then if trouble did start, maybe I could stop it before Great Eagle arrived. I went to the office, tried to finish some work. But I kept seeing the girl in front of me. Her and her say, I want to die. I want to die. Must have been three hours later when Chester came in. Told me that the trouble had started. It was Black Dawson down at the Alifraganza. said enough. When did you start deciding how much people can say, huh, Marshal? Huh? I'm taking this from you, Black, because I got enough trouble right now, but don't say any more. Now come outside with me and simmer down. Come outside and simmer down. Why should I listen to an Indian lover? Huh? Now, a man who's going to let those dirty... Take the Indians, come right into Dodge and take over. All right. All right, shut up. Shut up. Now you listen to me. 
And this goes for all of you. I'll not tolerate any trouble. When Great Eagle gets here, I don't want one wrong move out of any of you. Anything that happens here today might start a whole uprising among the Indians. And if you're too stupid to see that, you're going to be awful sorry. Now, I'm telling you right now. Why, right, Great Eagle's here. I'll kill the first man that starts trouble. An hour before sundown, the crowd started gathering along Front Street. They were talking and laughing and being loud. Too loud. They were nervous and trying not to show it, but they all wanted a front seat at the big show. They didn't want to miss anything. And then Black Dawson and his gang came out of the Oliver Ganza and st stood leaning up against a hitching rail. Finally, Chester came down from Boot Hill where he'd been on lookout, and he told me that he'd spotted Great Eagle and his braves. They were coming. I looked around, and everybody started to turn quiet. They knew. I told Chester to keep an eye on Dawson, and I started down the street. I crossed the plaza and walked to the river. Before the Indians started across the bridge, I stopped them. Great Eagle. I can't let you bring all your braves in. You may bring two, and that's all. You see all those people over there? They're just itching for trouble, and I can't chance it. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. I would bring all my braves. I'm sorry, Great Eagle, but don't try it. I turned and walked back into the plaza and stopped in front of Doc's office and stood. Waiting. Great Eagle and his band didn't move. They just sat there on their horses, looking into the plaza. The crowd had stretched all along Front Street now, and they had turned very quiet. Even Dawson and his gang were just standing, glowering across at the bridge. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And I waited. Must have been five minutes before Great Eagle turned and said something to his men and started out with two of his braves following. Nobody in the crowd along Front Street moved or said a word. Where is she? In here. She's in there. I want to talk. Come in with me. All right. Anoli. Her, her name means beautiful child. Is she not beautiful? Yes. She is, Great Eagle. Matt Dillon, I have done something today I have never before done. I have always thought myself a man of honor. But today I spoke a lie. To you. To me? Yes. I know of what happened to my daughter. I must tell you to regain at least part of my self-respect. All of it I can never regain. Many moons ago, my daughter disappeared. We searched for a long time, not knowing what had happened to her. Four days ago, she came back. She told me of her marriage to a white man and how she was with child. Of how she had met this man on the prairie and had fallen in love with him. Of how they had gone to Hayes City. Of the great love they had for each other. 
And she told me of the slow change that came over him. When his fellow men began to laugh at him and with derision call him Squaw Man. And how the white man is ashamed of the Indian. The white man has great pride. She told me how he turned her away, told her to go back to her own people where she belonged. Great Eagle, I'm very sorry. At that moment, I was with great anger and pride. And for this, I will never again be a man of honor. I told her to go back and live with the white people in shame. That she was no longer an Indian. That the Indian, too, is a proud people. I am responsible for her death. I turned away from her. You may do what punishment you like with me. I killed my daughter. No, Great Eagle, you... You didn't kill your daughter. She died because of pride. Yours and a white man's. As to your punishment, I think you're getting it right now. Now take her and go. As Great Eagle reached the bridge, the rest of his braves turned and joined him and rode slowly off across the prairie, out of sight. And along Front Street, the crowd started to break up and head for the bars to get drunk and laugh and brag about how brave they'd have been if anything had happened. Chester and I stood for a long time, and the streets were almost empty. It was sundown. Mr. Dillon, I'd be right proud to buy a drink. Chester, don't ever use the word proud in front of me again. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon. No, Chester, I'm... I'm sorry. Come on, I'll buy you a drink. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was written for Gunsmoke by William Conrad, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John McIntyre as Great Eagle, with Michael Ann Barrett, Lawrence Dobkin, and John Daner. Parley Bear is Chester, Georgia Ellis is Kitty, and Howard McNear is Doc. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in... Gun smoke. Premiere this Monday in the daytime on CBS Radio. Hear Walter O'Keefe in The Wizard of Oz, an exciting new audience participation show that's really an odds-on favorite to win with you. By all odds, hear The Wizard of Oz, Monday through Friday, on most of these same CBS radio stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking, and remember, the comedy treat that can't be beat is Jack Benny time on the CBS Radio Network.
Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the spell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. going out soon, Mr. Dillon? Oh, it's a little early yet, Chester. Things seem quiet enough. Well, why do you ask? Well, sir, I thought I might read this office up a little bit when you go. At night? Night wasn't made just for sleeping. That's what my mother used to tell us. <laughs> Chester, I'll bet you a dollar to a dime it was your father that said that. It was my father who... Well, of course. Did I say my mother? <laughs> oh, I sure never meant that. My goodness, no... She didn't believe in doing anything after dark except to read the Bible out loud. Well, that did you no harm. And anyway, you've more than made up for it since. Oh, now, Mr. Dillon, I'm not such a wild one as all that. I don't know, Chester. Every now and then you get a look in your eye that spells trouble for a pretty girl somewhere. <laughs> That's pure talk. You're just pure talk. Hey, what's that? I don't know, but it's close by. Come on. Look, right in the street. Yeah, I see him. But there's no one else around. Take a look down the alley, Chester. Yes, sir. All right, Shaw. <laughs> Shaw? Shaw, you bad hurt. Shot me right in the back, Marshal. Must have been in the alley there. Any idea who it was? No, sir. None at all. I'm bleeding some, Marshal. Yeah, I know. We better get you right up to Doc's. He can work on you better there. Uh, all right, a couple of you men, pick him up and follow me, huh? All right, Take it easy. Didn't see a thing, Mr. Dillon. I went right to the end of the alley, but there was an area of soul inside. Well, there's no use running around in the dark looking for him now. Maybe Shaw can tell us something after we get him in the docks here. Yes, sir. All right, put him on the couch there, huh? Easy with him now. Doc's not here, Mr. Dillon. I just looked out back. All right. Uh, you men, will you spread out and see if you can find Doc? Uh, try the Oliferganza first. Yeah, sure. Do something for me, Marshal. Now, don't you worry, Shaw. Doc will be here soon, and he's patched up a lot of men worse off than you are. Is there anything I can do, Mr. Dillon? Uh, yeah, here's his coat. Put it on the chair over there, huh? All right, sir. Shaw, do you mind if we talk while we're waiting for Doc? Well, if you want to know who did it, Marshal, I haven't an enemy in the world to know. Yeah, I know. But has anybody, anybody at all said anything lately or done anything that might have led to this? No, no. Well, did you see him at all? No, sir. But I did hear him say something about Stone, Marshal. That's all I heard. Stone. Uh, is that a man's name? Could be. Anyway, that's all I heard. Maybe thought I was somebody called Stone. I don't know. Well, I don't know any Stone... Not around here, anyway. No. Do you, Shaw? No, I don't. I'll see who that is, Chester. Yes, sir. Now, you, you let me know if there's anything I can do for you, Shaw. Sure will, Marshal. Thank you. I'll give it to him. Bye. Fell I found a hat out there, Shaw. Figured it must be yours. No. Uh, I'll put it over here with your coat. 
Is that your hat, Shaw? Yeah. Yeah, it's mine, all right. Hey, the founder, Mr. Dillon, he's coming across the street right now. Hey, Doc! Hey, Doc! Oh, he can't hear you, Chester. The window's closed. Oh. Yeah. Come on, let's get out of here. Uh, the Doc will be right here, Shaw. So long, Shaw. So long. <laughs> Peaceable fellow. It's a downright shame, that's what it is. Yeah. But he's right, Chester. He got shot by mistake. Oh? How come you're so sure, Mr. Dillon? Ah, his hat, for one thing. His hat? Yeah, it's the same shape and the same color as mine. It is? Yeah. And Shaw and I are built enough alike, we're close enough in size that somebody could possibly make a mistake. Especially at night. Well... Maybe. But that's stretching it some, if you ask me, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, except for one thing. I once knew a man named Stone. You knew him? You mean he's dead? Yeah. Well, if he's dead, then it couldn't have been him. Stone had a friend by the name of Danch, Chester. It might have been Danch. But why? Well, they were both cow thieves down in Matagorda County, it was. One day, Danch found his friend Stone hung from a live oak tree. I haven't seen Danch since that event, but I've heard that he's often sworn publicly that he's going to kill me for it. Well, did you? No, Chester. Probably some cattleman caught him using a straight iron and practiced a little quick justice. I wasn't even around. Uh I don't hang people, Chester. Oh, no, of course not. Anyway, if... That was Danch. He's probably still in Dodge. You'd have heard he shot the wrong man soon enough. You gonna go look for him, Mr. Dillon? Well, it's better than letting him look for me, Chester. Especially seeing the way he goes about it. Well, uh, what's he look like? In case I see him first. Well, he's tall, thin. He's got one mark you can't miss. You're standing on his left side, anyway. What's that? He had a fight somewhere and he got his ear chewed off. Oh, yeah. Unless he's growed another one, that ought to make him easy enough to spot. I might wander down and see if he's been around the Dodge house any, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. I'm going to make a round of the saloons. I'll uh, be at the Texas Trail last. Yes, sir. You sure you don't want a drink, Matt? No, no, not tonight, Kitty. <laughs> you must be expecting trouble. Yeah, maybe. Uh, Kitty, tell me something. Have you heard the name Danch around here lately? Danch? Yeah. No, no, I haven't. What's he look like, Matt? Well, he's a tall man. He's missing an ear. Oh, yeah. I saw a fellow like that a couple of nights ago. He was in here real late. Is that so? Yeah. You haven't seen him since? No, but I could ask the other girl. Hi, Mr. Dillon. Hello, Miss Kitty. Hello, Chester. Now, Mr. Dillon, you know that cheap rooming house out the edge of town, the one they call the Prairie Dog Hole? Yeah, what about it, Chester? Well, sir, I went to every other place, and then I tried it just on a chance. Sure enough, he was there. You mean you saw him? Oh, no, sir, he's gone. They said he rode in after dark last night, and he left before dawn. He hasn't been back since, and he took his horse with him. Oh. Yours. No. Uh, I'll put it over here for coat. Is that your hat, Shaw? Yeah. Yeah, it's mine. I think I'll keep sniffing the air just the same. <laughs> the next afternoon, about sundown, Shaw suddenly died. He hadn't been badly hurt, but as Doc said, you never know how a man's heart will react. Anyway, Shaw, the man without an enemy in the world, was dead, murdered, and in place of me. That night, I was walking down Front Street thinking about it and wondering why it is that the innocent so often get hurt. And all at once, I had a feeling that I was being followed. 
I walked on until I reached an alley and then turned into it casually. Once out of sight, I ran halfway down it and ducked behind a rain barrel. Waited. A few seconds later, I knew I'd been right. Depends on you, mister. All right. Now, come on. Get up. Yeah. Yeah. You you got my gun. I'm unarmed. You went off when you jumped me, that's all. Shut up. And turn around. All right. The jail's right around the corner. Walk ahead of me. And walk careful. I, I will. Sure, I will. That's it. Now open the door and go right on in. Sure, Marshal. Well, who is this, Mr. Dillon? I don't know. Who are you, mister? My name is Lee. Lee what? Bill Lee. All right, Lee. Now, why did you follow me down that alley with a gun in your hand? Oh, I wasn't following you, Marshal. No? Well, what were you doing? Well, I was just... Uh, it was dark down there, and I didn't want to take any chances. You know? All right, Lee. Did you shoot Shaw last night? Oh, that fellow got shot? Yeah, that's the one. Uh, no, Marshal. Why would I shoot him? There's no reason. None at all. You made a bad mistake. Ah... Uh... Look here, Marshal. You can't drag me in here and accuse me. Shut of... up. Now, all I want out of you is one thing. Did Danch hire you to kill me? You got nothing on me, Marshal. I've never heard of no Danch. Oh? No. All right, lock him up, Chester. Lock me up? What for? For lying. Now, wait a minute. That's illegal. It sure is. No, no, I mean, you, you can't put me in jail for... You just... show him what we can do, Chester. All right, mister. Right through that door. Go on. I see you tried for this, Marshal. I, I know my rights. Lee, the only right you got left is to be hung. And I hope it takes place real soon. <laughs> We will return to the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, a reminder to all vacation-bound Americans. Blood donations fall off in the summertime. Blood is vital to the saving of American lives. Give a pint of blood. Ask anyone who has. It's simple, painless. Make an appointment with your local Red Cross chapter. Give a pint of blood and save a life before you go on your summer vacation. Now, the second act. Of gun smoke. There were a lot of men on the frontier who were bad, and some of them were worse than others. But I always felt the rottenest kind was a man like Lee, whose guns could be bought. Every morning, Chester brought him out of his cell, and I questioned him. But he admitted nothing, day after day. And we kept him in jail anyway, and I hoped Danch would hear of it and come into town to do the job himself. But it isn't a good feeling to walk down the street and know that any minute you might get shot in the back. And finally, I got tired of it. I wanted to know where Danch was. Go ahead, Lee. Here he is, Mr. Dillon. You're wasting your time, Marshal. For the last time, Lee. You are gonna tell me where Danch is? I've told you a hundred times. I don't know Danch. Where'd he make his deal with you? I don't know nothing about no deal. 
I'm an innocent man, Marshal, and as soon as I get out of here, I'm going to write the government about you. Well, when you do, tell them how you messed up killing me. Huh? I'll tell them nothing. I mean, uh, I'll fix you, Marshal. Yeah, sure, sure. Tell me something, Lee. How does it feel to kill a man for money? <laughs> Don't look at me, Marshal. Nobody's paid me nothing. Yeah, but what about you? You get paid for shooting people. You get paid regular for it. Lee, I'm going to hit you right on the head and drag you back to your cell. Sure. I'm not armed. And I won't be armed. Now, wait a minute, Chester. Wait a minute. Just let him be. But that kind of talk just makes me boil. Yeah, I know. But I got a better idea of what to do with him. What? Now, we're not getting anywhere this way. Lee just isn't going to tell us anything. He's got his mind made up. I don't know anything, I told you. So keeping him locked up isn't going to help... You don't mean that... Yeah, turn him loose. Oh, no. Well, about time. You can't do that, Mr. Dillon. He'll just try to kill you again the first chance he gets. Maybe. But, Mr. Dillon, I don't... All right, go on, Lee. You're free. Now, get out of here. You really mean it, Marshal? You heard me. There's your gun. Take it. Don't pick it up by the butt. That's better. I wouldn't try nothing, Marshal. You'd die if you did. You're not fast enough to kill me face to face. No, no. I wouldn't try. Well, bye, Marshal, Chester. I'm leaving. I'm taking the next Santa Fe Dabbly. So long. Oh, Lee. Yeah? There's just one thing. What? You said I get paid for shooting people. Oh, now, Marshal, I didn't mean nothing. No, in a way, you're right. Sometimes I have to when there's no other way out. I understand. But I won't get paid for shooting you. What? No. I figure killing you will be part pleasure and part self-defense. What are you talking about, Marshal? Just that. Why would you want to shoot me? I don't like men of your kind. But, Marshal, you you can't. I can't let you get any farther than that boardwalk. I'd be a fool if I did. Now, go on, Lee. Go on out the door. Then I'm coming right after you. No. I'd feel a lot safer with you dead. Go on now. I'm staying right here. All right, then I'll kill you right here. Your arm. No. I'll give you my gun. Don't touch it. Don't kill me, Marshal. Don't kill me. I'll tell you anything you want. It's too late. Oh, no, no, Marshal. You'll probably lie anyway. No, I won't. I, listen to me. Dance is down the Santa Fe Trail about 75 miles across Cimarron, a place called Wagon Bed Spring. He is, huh? Yeah, he, he's waiting there for me. He's waiting to pay me when I... I, when you kill me, is that right? I, I'm not going to kill you, Marshal. No, no. Take his gun, Chester, before he changes his mind. He's a pretty brave man. Sure. Sure. Take it here. <laughs> there. Uh, I told you. Uh, let me go now, huh? You know, Danch isn't going to like your having killed the wrong man and me still walking around in good health, Lee. I hadn't thought of that. No. And the law wouldn't like it if I turned a murderer loose. So lock him up, Chester. You know the way, Lee. Mr. Dillon... You know what that cussed Lee told me just before we left? He said Danch had told him to yell lap for stone when he shot you. Well, I figured that. <laughs> you know, I think he really believed you'd have killed him if he'd walked out of that office. Cowards are easy to bluff, Chester. Now, when, when we get to Wagon Bed Springs, I want you to stay out of the way when I find Danch. Yes, sir, I will. Unless he has friends there. Yeah. I suppose he really believes you hung that fella stone, don't he? That seems that way. 
All right, let's pull up here, Chester. It's just over the hill there. We'll go on in as soon as it's dark. Wagon Bed Springs boasted a hotel with half a dozen rooms, a restaurant, and two saloons. All built of adobe. We're just a stopping point for bull whackers and mule skinners driving their freight wagons along the Santa Fe Trail. And such men didn't carry much money with them. When night came, Chester and I rode in, found a corral for our horses, and scouted the town. Danch wasn't anywhere in sight. So I decided to begin asking questions. Beer or whiskey, man? Beer. Same for me. Strangers, ain't you? Yeah. We're supposed to meet a friend here. Well, look around, mister. I have. I can't find him. Yeah. If he's in Wagon Bed Springs, you can find him. There you are. Thank you. This ain't a big town like Dodge and them places. Wished it was. You know, I'd like to see Dodge sometime. <sighs> well, that's where my friend may have gone. Maybe you saw him when he passed through here as a tall man. One ear. Oh? Calls himself Danch. Oh, sure. I, I know him. Uh, yeah, he was here quite a while, but he left just yesterday. He's uh, he's gone to Texas, Mister, not died. Uh, is that so? He tell you that? That's what he said when he left. All right, thanks. Sure. You stay in here long? Uh, not long. Here's for the beer. Uh, we'll be back as soon as we eat. Good. Say, did you mean it in there, Mr. Dillon? Are we really going to eat supper again? Chester, that barkeep said he'd never seen Dodge. Well, he was there last fall. I remember his face. Well, now, what's he trying And if to... he was in Dodge, he knows who I am. Danch is here somewhere, and that barkeep's going to get word to him mighty fast. Here, let's cross the street. Where are we going? I will follow him when he goes to tell Danch I'm here. Mm. He'll leave as soon as he thinks we're in the restaurant. All right, he won't see us here. Can I go with you, Mr. Dillon? If you stay out of the way. I will, sir. I'd figured it right. And in a few minutes, the barkeep came out into the street and walked down toward the edge of town. We followed some distance behind until he reached a small adobe hut. And there he knocked and then disappeared inside. The hut had no windows we could see, but I sent Chester around back to make sure. He returned in a moment, and I told him to wait while I went up to the door. Who's that? You're trapped, Danch. Come out with your hands up. All of you here, you fool. I didn't see him. He said he went to supper. I ought to kick him. I got nothing to do with this. I'm getting out of here. Go ahead, get out. Marshal! Marshal, I'm coming out. I ain't even armed, so don't shoot. Okay. Come on. Go on. You, you got to open it more than that, Danch. I can't get out. All right, keep your hands up. Chester. I'll take him. Keep an eye on him. Come on, you. I won't do anything. He paid me to warn him, that's all. Danch, you're in a bad spot. You can rot in there. I don't suppose you'd give me a fighting chance any more than you gave Stone one, Dylan. I was in Galveston when Stone got hung, Danch. That's a lie. Oh, it doesn't matter. How come you hired Lee to shoot me? You lost your nerve? How many cattlemen in Dodge, that's why. Yeah, I forgot your reputation with cows. And I don't care how you die anyway. Yeah, you talk big for a man who's practically buried. 
I'm coming out, Dylan. And I'm coming with a gun. You better not do it, Danch. I'll have to kill you. I'd hang anyway. And I just might get you. I backed off around the corner of the hut and waited. Danch opened the door wide. And he suddenly sprang out, a gun ready in each hand, expecting to face me. He stood there for a second before he realized that he'd been trapped again. And then he made his choice. And started for the corner of the hut where I was. All right, drop him, Dan. Okay, Chester. Is he dead? Yeah. Well, he tried to kill you, Marshal. It was self-defense, pure and simple. Oh, shut up. What do we do with this man, Mr. Dillon? Let him go, Chester. He's just scum. All right, sir. And you'll bury him, mister. He paid you. Yes, sir. I'll take care of it. And if I ever see you in Dodge, you'll go to jail. Oh, no, sir. I wouldn't be coming in. Come on, Chester. Let's get out of here. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Vic Perrin, Harry Bartell, and Lou Krugman. Harley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. people to have letters added to their names as universities award degrees to scholars. Here on CBS Radio, we're having a somewhat similar procedure. This Monday, the letters KQV, WHYN, and KTHS will be added to CBS Radio. Yes, on behalf of our affiliated stations from coast to coast, CBS Radio welcomes to the network where America listens most Station KQV in Pittsburgh. Station WHYN, serving the greater Springfield Holyoke area. And radio station KTHS, serving Little Rock, Arkansas. This is Roy Rowan speaking over the CBS Radio Network. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe.